Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Chiko Dile Melomado, and I'll be chairing this roundtable discussion today. We'll be looking at the impact and the legacy of Chinua Achebe's uh, Arrow of God. I'm seeing as this is 50 years since the book was published. And to my left is Dele Meji Fatunla, who is, I have it here, <laughs> the communications manager for the Royal African Society. And to my right is Chibun Donuzo, who is the author of The Spider King's Daughter. Right, I'm going to kick it off with mm. Dele. Tell me yes. who it is that you think in, in uh, literature Chino Achebe most resembles? Okay. Um, so I have to confess that first, uh, speaking to this audience, I'm actually approaching this very much as a reader because I, I don't, uh, I'm not part of the distinguished and esteemed intellectual and academics here, yet anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I really do think, um, for me, as a, as, a, as a reader, the people that most echo for me with Achebe are Toni Morrison, and Chimamanda Adichie in terms of their project. Because I, I, uh, Toni Morrison talks about um, her work as kind of an act of rememory. And what she calls rememory is, in a way, remembering something which has never, or not forgetting something which has never been remembered. So it's, it's going over historical instances that are perhaps neglected, or experiences of people that are perhaps neglected, and actually bringing that to the fore in very personal and vivid imagination. Um, and I think if you look at the work of Toni Morrison, um, and I was very glad that um, Nana um, Aibia Clark mentioned that Toni Morrison contributed to the, um, the tribute to Chinu Achebe because, um, in a way, Chinu Achebe precedes both her and um, Chimamanda Adichie. And a lot of what he was doing with uh, setting Things Fall Apart in the 1890s and uh, Arrow of God in the 1920s is actually giving you a very lived historical experience of what it's like to be in traditional... African culture, and even though the differences are not very grand, they are very subtle. They're very different, uh, subtle differences in time between what's happening in, uh, and this is in the traditional setting, not the colonial, in Arrow of God and, and things fall apart. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, to an extent that Chinu Achebe is, is sort of like the historian of maybe Igbo culture, maybe in a wider sphere, the African traditional culture? Yes, I mean, so bold, I yeah, think. I mean, I think, I mean, it's it's quite obviously acknowledged that he is he is a historian, but I think it's something slightly more profound than just saying that he's a historian. I think what he's actually creating for you is that he's revalorizing particular aspects of culture. I'll give you an example. Um, I think if you read um, Arrow of God, for me, one of the things that's very striking is the description of the architecture of those of the village and the way that it's actually. You can almost feel the tenderness with which he's touching the walls, with which he's describing the way people move around that space. Because I think if you speak to anybody in, a lot of people at least in places in Nigeria nowadays or in the rest of Africa, they might actually look askance at the, arch, the traditional architecture. And in books like Arrow of God, what you see is somebody actually making you look at that um, culture on its own terms, but also making you realize that actually that... Um, that materialness is rich as, uh, I don't quite know how to put this to people to make them understand the depth of feeling with which um, I see it, is that he, it's, yeah, it's almost like if you can imagine a father looking at a newborn child, that's kind of what he's making you do with the way you're looking at evil culture in his work. And Chibundu, this one is for you. What would you say for you has been the impact of Arrow of God in particular, but maybe Chinua Achebe's body of work? Actually, it's funny. I only read Arrow of God for the first time a week and a half ago when I was asked to do this panel. It's the only piece of Achebe. Hey, I've confessed to you. Everybody's told me. <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only piece of, it's the only Achebe book that I haven't read. And again, for me, um, when I heard that um, I think he described it as his novel that he's most likely to reread, which was kind of like, I guess, his own way of saying it was kind of his favorite book, because he said you can't choose, you can't pick your favorite child. Yeah. But then I was like, ah, how can he diss things fall apart like that? I, I took it personally. Um, so yeah, I just haven't come, a, come along to reading it. And then 
having read it, I didn't know it was like the missing piece in reading all of Achebe's um, fiction, and it was, I, I can see why, why he would describe it like that. I think Arrow of God, Chinu Achebe as a whole, it's interesting what he did for one generation, which is my parents' generation. Um, and I, I haven't, I think my father has the best kind of one-line review of Achebe, and he says, Achebe showed the good in Igbo culture, and he showed the bad. And it was very important for people of a generation who've been always told they are savages, they are lower than white people, to be presented their culture. No, it's, it's, not, senti it's not a sentimental um, look. It's not over romanticized. Yeah, I read, um, and what I like about Achebe, as opposed to um, Shoinka, I know this is not a comparative, comparative <laughs> panel. There's no competition, Nobel versus no Nobel. Um, but um, I like, there's no, there's no romanticism at all. And he shows you aspects of the culture that reading in 21st century, you read and you're like, ah. I think the, um, the bit about human sacrifice, I read, in fact, I, I wrote it down. It says, I'll read it to you. When we want to make a charm, we look for the animal whose blood can match its power. If a chicken cannot do it, we look for a goat or a ram. If that is not sufficient, we send for a bull. But sometimes even a bull does not suffice then we must look for a human. Do you think it is the sound of the death cry gurgling through blood that we want to hear? And I read that in 2014, and I was just like, hey, I'm glad I don't live in, in, in that village. But then at the same time, what he did was he brought that this was a rational society. They did not do things. This, this was their understanding of the world. And there, there is no judgment of, you know, th 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 this was how they understood the wor world. They didn't do things because they were savages. They didn't do things because they were not capable of compassion. They didn't do things because, you know, th this deep, dark, um, dark place. I think it's that unflinching look at the past, looking at the good, looking at the bad, and saying they, are, they were as human, as, as civilized, as, as, as anything, as any other culture. And as a writer, how would you say that, that this has helped you? Do you think it has had an impact on your writing at all? Um, I think for me, the, the Achebe book that has kind of had the biggest impact on my writing was probably Things, things Fall Apart. Um, but um, I guess this is coming later in my... So I, I can't say now what impact Arrow of God is going to have. I think for me, what I found to be interesting was I read Arrow of God a few times as a child and I've read Things Fall Apart as well. <clears throat> and I only just... I'm going to top your story there because I'm a story topper. Um, I only just came... <laughs> I reread um, Arrow of God yesterday, so I spent about 10 hours reading it, and I have a child, so that wasn't easy. Um, and I found, what I found was that I thought I could, I thought I would see something new that I didn't see while I was, that I didn't see while I was a child. And I think what Arrow of God, and maybe to a large extent, um, things fall apart, um, no longer at ease, has made me realize is the ease with which we tell our stories now. Um, and by that I mean, it's not difficult for us to go within ourselves as writers and to represent who we are to the world. I think growing up, I, I, I took Chinua Achebe for granted a little bit, but that was because um, I was born in the kind of, that kind of generation, I think, that would, that would take something like that for granted. You know, My parents, obviously, this was a major breakthrough for them, but for me, I took it for granted because, well, it was there. And also to an extent, because our parents, like you, like you mentioned, our parents, they, they didn't really, um, you know, your, your father said he, that Achebe showed the good and the bad in Igbo culture. But I think my, my parents, um, this kind of, his stories kind of stood in the stead of what my parents would have talked to us about. So they were from the Biafra generation, and everybody just wanted to sweep everything under the carpet and just move on with it. And they were children of people who had met the white man. So they were like a duche in that respect. They all wanted to move on with it, you know, go to school, go to university, have a white collar job, be a doctor, be a something, be white, basically. And so I think that for me, personally, Achebe not only made it possible for me to see myself in literature, see my culture in literature. I mean, I come from an area called Oba, which is in um, Idemili local government area. So we still have the whole Python reverence thing. And it made sense to me, you know, I could see my village in Umaro. Um, it was also that he was some sort of surrogate grandfather in that while our parents were busy getting on with it, we were reading Achebe and 
discovering for ourselves the world that our grandfathers and great grandfathers lived in. I sorry, I wanted to come in actually on that point yes. again about about parents because um, I think it was it was writers like Achebe, and I don't actually know if my dad would say would, would say this, but he definitely must have been part of. He gave them. He empowered them to assert their culture. So, for example, all my dad and all his siblings, they all have Christian names, I, <laughs> English names, yeah. you know, Malcolm, Bertram, all sorts. You know. <coughs> um, but none of us, none of my siblings and none of my cousins have, um, you know, Christian names. You know, we have Igbo names, we have Yoruba names, depending on where the wives they married came from. But none of us have. And I think it was this idea that um, if you ask my dad, why none of us have English names. He'll tell you he's never seen a white man called Obina. So why should, <laughs> so why should any of his children have, um, have English names? And I think this, this way of thinking, this like, you know, and in the sense that we took on Christianity, but you know, we were not ashamed of, of who we are, even despite the fact that, you know, we, because people convert in other places. Conversion doesn't always have to be such a brutal, Erosion. You know, erosion of, of your culture and your identity. Um, yeah. And tell me, um, Dele, coming back to you now, <laughs> tell me, um, do you think that in spite of, I don't know, maybe, um, I guess what I'm trying to ask you is <laughs> about, we, Chibune made a point now about Christianity, and how much do you think that Arrow of God or Achebe's body of work, how much do you think that that helped your understanding of the way that Christianity came into play. Okay. Your appreciation uh, maybe of um, I have a few things written here which I'm going to read because it's probably easier for me to get those points across. But I actually think that, um, I think Arrow of God is an apologia for Christianity in the sense that it's what Achebe is essentially doing is he's, um, he's providing the psychological rationale for how his people came to be a group of people that would actually abandon their gods. It's a very traumatic experience. And, um, uh, and I guess he, and then the, un the underpinning that he, that he puts under it is that it actually comes down to political economy and the reason that they abandon their gods is essentially because they were not going to be able to eat if they did not do that. Um, but he also, I think, is providing a psychological platform for people like him who I consider, I mean, I, I think the, the whole group of people who became your parents and my parents are sort of Nigerian Creoles. They're not Creoles in this way that, you know, Sierra Leonean Creoles are Creoles, but they're Creoles in kind of their psychological makeup because um, you kind of want to valorize your traditional culture, but you're also taking, you need to have a kind of a, a reconciliation with traditional religion. So what Achebe does in the novel is that he actually makes Ulu, who is the, the god of his society, sort of melt into the Christian god. And there's a section where he actually does, and I'd just like to read a little bit of that so that you can get, get the scent. So uh, if I can find it. OK, there he goes. He goes, if Ulu had spotted the white man as an ally from the very beginning, it would explain many things. It would explain Eze Ulu's decision to send Oduche to learn the ways of the white man. It was true Eze Ulu had given other explanations for his decision, but those were the thoughts that had come into his head at the time. One half of him was man, and the other half, mo. The half that was painted over with white chalk at important religious ceremonies, and half of the things he ever did were done by this spirit side. So I think that that's kind of it, because for me what's very perplexing is that there's a part of I think a lot of people, if you're not a Christian, as I'm not, uh, and you're kind of an African, pan-Africanist, rationalist, you think, why don't we just abandon these, this Christianity and Islam? And you find the evangelism in Africa quite perplexing because you think it's not working for us on lots of levels. But when you see what Achebe is doing, he's showing you is that this reconciliation happened. So there's a very large group of people, Achebe included, who are actually vested in a rational society which is actually based on Judeo-Christian values but melded in with traditional African religions. And that's kind of what I think is happening in Arrow of God. Because you're trying to say he, he, you, borrow, you borrow the bits that are, we, we heard this in the last yeah. session, you, know, you borrow the bits that work yeah. and you, you take away the bits that don't work and Meld them put together. them together. Yeah. But I, yeah, but I mean, I think it's, it's very, it's unconscious. I don't think it's that conscious. I don't think Achebe was necessarily setting out to write a book where, you know, he melts traditional and... Um, Christian faith. I don't, I don't think it's conscious, 
But I think what it does is that it kind of gives a lot of people who aren't in the traditional religion anymore a kind of footing to be able to say, well, I can attach to my culture because in a way we're still worshipping the same God. It's just in a very different way. You wanted to add to this point? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing you say about melding is interesting. Um, I mean, I looked at it from a historical perspective. So obviously there was a time when England or Great Britain was a pagan country. And so I, was, I did a bit of research on how this island was converted. Because when Christianity came to Britain, it didn't come with a lot of force behind it. You know, 40 missionaries were sent you know, to the island. So what Pope Gregory, who sent these missionaries, advised them to do was to first live among the people to look at their culture, to look at their festivals, to look at their feasts, and in an essence, Christianize. So in the sense that so there are many festivals, Christmas, you know, that you know have, have roots in pagan origins, but the the focus of the festivals have in a way I suppose changed. Um, and I don't know, I mean because I'm a Christian, so I don't um, um I, I don't see it as a as a totally negative thing. Pe people I mean that's People hear a new idea, they hear a new way, and if there's no force behind it, some people, they just, you know, this, for them, this then becomes, this is the truth, they believe this. So, um, the difference, I suppose, when Christianity came to Nigeria was, you know, it came with, it came with force, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It, came, it came with, um, it came with force behind it. And you can see how with, with um, many festivals, in traditional culture. You can see how a missionary that was sent with the purpose of seeing these people as also human beings could have preached the gospel in a way that could have melded the two. Again, I, I wrote down a passage. This is from the festival of the pumpkin leaves. And so this is um, Ezeulu. This is what he says. Pronounce it for me. Ezeulu. I'm half Yoruba as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so this is what, at the festival of the pumpkin leaves, the book says, this is what they pray. I implore, and they're praying to Ulu, I implore you to cleanse my household of all defilement. If I have spoken it with my mouth, or seen it with my mouth, or seen it with my eyes, or if I have heard it with my ears, or stepped on it with my foot, or if it has come through my children, or my friends, or kinfolk, let it follow these leaves. And then, you know, the villagers trample on the leaves, and then, you know, Ezulu says, you know, he has trampled on the sins of Omar until his feet have bled. And, you know, I've, I read them and I thought, you know, these are very Christian images. These are images that, you know, could easily have, when you came to preach the gospel, you could easily have taken stories that people already had to say, you know, and I mean, because um, what was appealing to the first Britons was that, you know, they said, you know, this is universal. You know, we're, we're preaching a, a religion that is universal. Um, and every society is trying to deal with the existential problem of sin and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yes, that, that wasn't done. And I think writers like Achebe, what you were saying about giving people a footing to stand on who converted to this new religion. I mean, my parents, um, my dad in particular, who is Igbo, you know, he went to church in a time where you know, you weren't allowed to drum in church. You weren't allowed to dance in church. You know, you weren't allowed to, you know, because those were like pagan things you yeah, did. Yeah, pagan know. instruments. Yeah, if, yeah, if you didn't wear English clothes, you weren't a Christian. And I, and I think to a certain extent, I mean, I know a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of angst directed at, you know, the new Pentecostalism, et cetera, et cetera. But I do feel that those churches allowed Africans to take their culture back in the sense that, you know, you went to all these Pentecostal churches and you could go in your, in your native and your damask and dance and have the talking drum, which, you know, is like, obviously it speaks. It does. Um, and now I find when I go to Anglican church in my village now, you know, it's very different from when my dad went to Anglican church when he was younger because, you know, now everybody's dancing in the aisles and, you know, it's, um, you know, we've brought our culture, culture back. back into it. Yeah. But what, I mean, I guess some of the things that I think is, to what extent in Achebe's writing, the way he talks about these things, I think, I think that he himself is actually quite a dip, deeply biblical or Christian writer. And there, there are echoes of that in, in the writing. Hmm. And so I, I mean, I may be, I think he may be, you may be to some extent subverting tradition, actually, Achebe himself, to make it consumable for a society that's already, that has already changed. 
So, you know, because when you read, in a way, maybe, did he, is he writing that with the intent of describing faithfully the traditions that existed, or is he writing it in a way that actually makes it relatable to you? But I guess the thing is, again, with the thing going back to my dad, is that, you know, he showed the good and he showed the bad. And I feel that someone who was trying to, to remake tradition would have left things out. So, for example, have you seen um, Shoenka's um, Death on the King's Horseman? Yep. Um, and what I find very interesting about that play is that the central theme is the death of an Oba in which somebody voluntarily gives their life so the king has a horse to ride into the afterlife. And, and yes, th this happened, this is true. Yeah, there was like yeah. voluntary suicide or whatever, the spirits took the, well, well, however you want to see it. <laughs> however, it's not complete. There were also people that involuntarily were forced to, to give their lives, like the Oba's maids and his household. They were also killed along. And I feel he didn't add this aspect of the tradition, almost in a sense because he, he there's no how Wale Shenga would have, have known about the extra, extra bits of that tradition, but it was almost in order to make a point, yeah. he would kind of pair out. What, what, point do you, what point do you think well, that is? Well, the point is, um, me, I felt it was like, you know, the Western people, they don't understand that uh, this, is not, um, this is not a barbaric custom. This is, this is like part of, it's first of all, he's not killed. It's a voluntary act, etc., etc. But um, I felt that there might have been justification for intervention for those who did not voluntarily want to enter the afterlife with the, <laughs> with the other. But, I, and I feel like, if it had been an Achebe book, he would, he, would have, he would have shown you, like, you know, some people went voluntarily and some people didn't, and that was their rationale. And some people were buried up to their necks. Well, yeah, and with roasted, with roasted, roasted yams for vultures exactly. to peg yeah. them, and, and he does not apologize for that. That was the society in the same way that there have been many barbaric practices in European society, both pre-Christian and post-Christian, so th there's, there's no apology. Like, he's not, I, I don't even feel as if he's writing back I, I just write him back to perceptions. He's just saying this was this was what it was. Yeah, um, yeah. And Dele, I want to find out. I just found out recently that Dele also writes. I read his poem in Jalada magazine. Find it. Um, do you think that that Achebe has had any impact on your writing, on the way that you perceive yourself as a writer? I asked Chibunde this, but I forgot to ask it hmm. of you. Um, I mean, I don't. I, okay, I also read Arrow of God last year, by the way, but not because. Yeah, actually, it was because of a video thing I watched with Chimamanda talking about it. But it's it's very strange because I kind of skipped it. I read things fall apart. I read yeah, the other yeah, same. Ones. And I read the other uh, one. I did it. I read. Savannah. I read it all. Yeah. I think I should get a prize. Or maybe maybe <laughs> maybe I read Arrow of God and I don't remember it, which I think is actually probably. Yeah, I'm a, sorry, a but more, you did it. If you read it, you remember. <laughs> <more crime. laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> At the Arrow of God Symposium. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. No, but I, okay, one of the things I had a problem with, with kind of our um, post-colonial writers, is this, sometimes you have this impression that the language is very heavy and turgid and, you know, Miserable, educated. misery porn. Yeah, yeah and not, I mean, but like worthy, but actually when, it always surprises me when you go back and read the books mm. later, and especially as an adult, you were very struck. I mean, the word fucked comes up in this story. Yes. There's a lot of sex in Arrow of God. You know, if, that, yeah. if you haven't read it, then you should read it for that. I um, actually but not, not sex, actually, sensuality, because it's hinted at. It's different. But, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's very, and one of the things that I, because I'm, I'm very um, appreciative of Proverbs, and I like the way, what I, I like um, the way Africans have very proverbial language, and I think we still do it even in contemporary culture. So I think, and the challenge for writers, I think in the contemporary times, is to do it in a way that doesn't make us sound like we're in the 1890s. Like we're yes. trying to copy you. Um, and yes. so mm -hmm. for me, it's kind of looking at how Achebe is, is doing that, but trying to adapt that into what I'm, when I'm writing. Because I'm actually at the moment, I'm trying to write a story where, which is set, it's kind of contemporary times, but the, the character is an Ob Obatala worshiper. But, yes. And you want to allude to things, but not, um, you don't want to be heavy handed. Yes. And I think yes. Achebe gives you that kind of. I think that's an actually a very interesting point that you make because I think one thing I, I try to find a balance to is how to write in Nigerian English because there's, there's um, and actually in my first of all, I didn't notice I did it until one of my reviewers pointed out who a Nigerian and she said, you know, she didn't feel, you know, the language was elevated enough for somebody who wants to publish on a global <laughs> stage. But I said something like, when they reached the gates, mm. And apart, what would you say in English? 
when they arrived at the game. Well, hey, but reach, it's, yeah. it's like, when they reach, it's but reach is it's perfect. A, yeah, but it's a transliteration, isn't yeah. it? You think about it in, in when a, they reach. In a, in a, when, when they reach the game. Yeah. And I don't know, that there's, there are certain ways we. I'm trying to think of, for example, like um, of the light. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why? That's the problem, you know. Someone says of the light and they say you, you've misspoken English. Why? No. But you understand what I, I'm going to say, my sister, right? It's about communication, it's not a shell. Um, exactly yeah yeah yes. but that's the that's kind of the way we speak and and I, yes. I think so I yeah or they'll say you fell me down <laughs> yes yes or dress dress, <laughs> dress. <laughs> 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 But yeah, I feel like there's there's a contemporary way that we speak English that is you know different. It, so it's for me, it's not about writing in proverbs. For me, it's like capturing that way that the essence the, of it. Yeah, the way we speak English now, which is is different grammatically and syntactically from. But would you say though that um, Chinua Achebe helped your appreciation of proverbs before before you read any of his work? Did you know any proverbs, for instance? Yeah, I was actually going to say that um, anybody who went to school in Nigeria, do you remember this um, blue book called First Aid in English? Yeah, yeah yes. Oh, wow, it does matter how old yeah. you write, yes. We yeah. all use First Aid in English. And there's this silly, like, five-page section where you have to cram all these proverbs. And, you know, you get all these, a like, cat may look at a king, which I, I discovered when I came to England. Nobody even uses these things anymore. But, you know, a stitching time saves life. Yeah, yeah, and then, um, you know, make hay while the sun shines. I forgot what was hay. I mean, I've never seen hay before. <laughs> and you are learning, make hay. But instead of, you know, and, and then you learn all the, a toad does not run in the daytime unless something is after it. Why did they not have those pages in first aid? I mean, you know, they could have done a Nigerian because edition. Because it makes sense. Yeah, yeah exactly. It makes, it makes sense. sense to us, you know. So, so many. Um, and then we learn the similes as cool as a cucumber. You know, there's no cucumber that is cool in the Nigerian market. They're all hot. <laughs> the sun has beaten all of them. So, yeah. So, <laughs> any last words? Um... Any yeah, other wrap-up points? Actually, because I was... Okay, well, anyways, I, I, the, 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 the um, thing I was going to say is that I loved Achebe's Proverbs, and I think the one that struck me the most was... I think what Joe already said it, which is when suffering knocks on your door and you say there's no, no seat left for him, he says not to worry, he has brought his own stool. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, uh, yeah. Oh, I was actually actually going to talk about the um, structure of the novel, which I thought I found quite experimental in the sense that there's um there's the I guess there's a forward moving plot and you're following this priest mm -hmm. but it also kind of Branches. meanders mm -hmm. kind of like mimicking that village life of you know people visiting people talking discussing and then following people's point of view on mm -hmm. onward so it's not just the one you have a protagonist yes but they have you follow different people for like a short amount of time. Yes, I found that very interesting. What he also you saw it from you know winter bottom or winter bottom mm -hmm. perspective and Clark and yeah and Akokalia to some extent until he who's not ready to hear. Oh, sorry. Until he dies. Uh -huh. <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah, I've ruined it. Yeah. Should sorry. Have come for the arrow. Symposium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so want I mean, I, I understand what you mean about the structure, but what I found was that it, it might it's not just mimic, mimicking village life. It's more about mimicking, I found, the Igbo way of telling stories. Mm. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time with my, with my grandma because she was very Catholic and very strict, so I was scared of her. Sorry, grandma. And, um, but I found out that when she did, when she was open to telling us stories, the stories, she could tell them over a few nights. So say we were spending a week with her, she could, it was like a thousand and one nights, one of those Arabian, you know, the thousand and one. So she'd, she'd tell the story and she was always like going in and out of the story and you had the refrain, you know, and you and you sing and, you know. So I found that maybe the, the story, even though it wasn't, um, like it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't really like um, things fall apart, I found that it, it seemed to follow that meandering structure. It wasn't, they'll probably ask us not to write that way right now. Like yeah. now, yeah, you know, definitely. you're supposed to, Follow one person, course. exactly, yeah, and stick definitely. with them, or two people and stick with them. You don't just jump around. So maybe in that regard, he was ahead of his time. Yeah, and I think what it would be interesting to ask him, if, if you could, would be if... Because obviously he writes from 
a white man's perspective, right from Winter Boseman, mm. a couple of the other officers. And I know um, when he was in university, they gave him a book, Joyce Carey, you know, Mr. Johnson. Yes. And he felt that this book didn't mirror like his own, you know, experience of being an African and he felt it was patronizing in many ways. And I wonder what feedback he got from his, you know, English readers who read the book and thought, actually, no, we feel this is a reduction of the colonial officer mm. and, you know, the pacification of the Niger Delta. Is that really how they thought? Is that? Yeah. But he gets it right because actually one of the things I liked about the book is the way that he gets class, right? Because there's this, the character of Clark is so in, intimidated by Winter Bottom. Until he falls and, ill. Until he falls ill. Yeah. And you just see that, you know, you, it's this thing of where, I can't remember who says it, but you know, we've, We've studied you, but you've never really known us. Yeah. So he's, his eye on them is very, very... Uh, okay. huh? I think it's yeah, yeah, you know, sort of like you... And then, um, in comparison, Toni Morrison talks about this, this whole idea of she writes... Uh, she talks about African-American men writing from or always being conscious of the white gaze. And I, what I like about this book, particularly Hour of God, is that even though, obviously, you have this experience of colonialism there, I think whenever you're in the village, you never get this sense of this other world. Yes. You know, it's yeah. so all-encompassing. This Even though he did, he did mention that people between different villages um, felt that their village was their own little world. Yeah. So if they had to travel six miles to mm. Mary, then they'd feel like yeah. we're in a totally yeah. different... Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I like, but I like the... I just think that for me, what's interesting is just getting into the... Because I have to say that I think most of us are actually very far from that metaphysical world where people thought in, in, in a way that actually they took the fact that, you know, this uh, python or this river is a potent um, force or, you know, that, yeah, that there's a living force to those traditional ideas, whereas now for us they are mythologies and they're myths, but in other, in very... At some point. Eh? Yeah, to not, some, yeah. To Who some, is mythology? To some, to in my village, they are still doing my <laughs> No, no, no. no. But, but, no. She's joking. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if I am. I mean, people, I mean, people still go to visit Baba. Well, yes, Baba they, I mean, I, I think... I yeah, think no, but I, I think what I'm saying is not... It's priests. not like... I think there are people who believe and there are people who still yeah. do, but I'm actually saying from my perspective and from the perspective of, I think, a lot of urban Africans that it, big, this big psychological trauma happened and there are actually these groups of people who are... Very separate. Very separate. People who think in a Judeo-Christian world and people who think very differently, maybe. And then there are people who flow in between. I don't know. I think mm -hmm. most, most people kind of uh, flow in between. I mean, I know, I mean, growing up in Lagos, you know, sometimes you go to a crossroad and you see somebody has left. Yes. <laughs> and all the cars yes. will just be swerving past because obviously if you drive over it, you take whatever trouble the person has. I mean, some people believe yeah. has personally. And many people believe because, uh, and even if you don't believe, you don't want to take a chance. Yeah. Just, <laughs> like, you know, just, just in just case. Just in case. Yes. Just in case. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just in case. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel. I, I feel we kept. We haven't discarded us as much as you we know think. as we think. Yeah. I mean, there was one prayer um, that they prayed um, where they said something like, you know, anybody who doesn't come here with good intent, let that bad intent follow them. And I thought this. They're always accusing Pentecostal churches of you know this type of prayer. <laughs> My enemies must fall down and die. You see, it started in yeah. a traditional, <laughs> traditional. Um, yes. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, yeah, exactly. Back to sender. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I've always wondered uh, myself to what extent the Igbo culture of doing away with gods who didn't favor you, mm. what part that played in how easily they were overtaken by yes, yes, yes. I, I, Christianity. Yes. Definitely. But were they overtaken? Because I, I think that's, sorry, maybe that's a little bit of what I was trying to say, which mm. is that he's giving you this point that actually we did what is precisely in our tradition, which to is... To do, which is replace an old God that doesn't work for a, a new, new one. Yeah. I think that's what, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so our discussion has, has ended, but if you have any questions or comments, we'd like to... To hear them, but can, before, can you please tell me if it's a question or a comment? And if you're asking a question, can you keep it to one? So don't go on a long thing. I expect either of them to remember what you said. Just one question, please. Thank you. Uh, just, just some thoughts on the. Uh, it's a comment, actually, a very quick okay. comment. Thank you. I, I, I thought the there's a there's a book by Donatus Mwoga, uh, uh, the critic. Uh, it's called uh, some book I think published eighty four, uh, called the Supreme God in the World Thought or something thereabout. 
where the issue, I think uh, the Reverend raised it in the morning about uh, uh, when, she, when he referred to Catherine Achalono on the issue of the provisionality, really, of the relationship between the Igbo and their gods. If, it, if the god doesn't do something, then you create a new god. Yes, mm. the toy are down, Carlos. Exactly. According to Fino. Exactly. Yes. So I, I, I think, it, I, but again, it's provisional. Because let's not forget that, that's why uh, uh, Achebe himself was saying that in terms of Igbo thought, the concept of um, the, um, the god, uh, sorry, I'm the father, mm. the son, and the Holy Spirit will be quite a problem. It will mm. be problematic. Because it defies the concept of the dark duality which had been dealt with throughout the, throughout, throughout the seminar, or, the, or, or, or sorry, throughout the, the, the symposium, that where one thing starts, another starts. So that I'm the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost were actually the alien, even in terms of that ego uh, thought system. Mm. Would you like to? to? I think mean, there's a bit in the book where it you know, says something about Chuku who holds the something of the world. I'm going to search, search my book. Maybe, maybe leave it and just, and just say what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Um, Nini, from my, um, I guess from what my parents told me, there was an idea of, you know, Chuku, who was kind of... All powerful. All powerful. Yes. But then, you know, in your day-to-day -day affairs, you know, you went through your ancestors or you went through... Or your own personal God. Or your own personal mm -hmm. God. Or, um, that was what I was taught. But I haven't really investigated it further. Would you be willing to? Yeah, next time I go to the village. Which is? <laughs> um, Ubulu. Okay. Well, let us know. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions? So can I make a, a quick interjection? Very, uh, last year, from um, the, at our conference. Was it last year? Um, last year. No, last year. Last year. Um, uh, Oyekachi <laughs> brought this contentious issue. About China Eke. So the, uh, the, the, the given opinion is that it's God who creates, as God the creator. But he was making the argument that it's actually a duality, Chi and Eke, being opposing, uh, basically like God and the devil kind of thing. You know, so he was trying to make that argument, and people mm. were kind of shooting him down. <laughs> so it might I be. I should shoot him down right yeah. now. If another argument is actually social, I cannot acknowledge that. Yes. I cannot agree with Onyekachi. Yes. And also, Morgan would agree. Yes. Um, I cannot even argue. I think he's the one not yet in place. Yes. Yes. I cannot argue that this was an attempt by the Christians during this conquest period to actually change it to the same time. Of the, of, of, of the concept of chineke, yes. okay? Yes. To have this notion of a creator yes. rather than chi na eke. Three words, yes. not, 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 not inclusive. Mm. Chi na eke, are, are three different things, not chineke. So it's the Christian. And I think you do see this elsewhere. I think the point about trying to incorporate certain local traditions Within the within the context of 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 either uh, spreading a particular kind of religion was not was not was not new in, in the African on the African mm -hmm. scene. The only difference though, on the African scene was the issue, the question of conquest, was going on simultaneously. Um, hello, hi. Uh, just a comment, more than anything. Um, I think there's there's a phrase in um, in several of Achebe's books. Uh, I think one of the um, the education for British protected child or something, where he, you know, he tried to, con one of his, uh, I think his father tried to convert his uncle, and he goes, uh, and his uncle points to all his charms and all his titles and says, well, what will I do with these? Mm -hmm. And I think that phrase is, is kind of pertinent to what you've been discussing, you know, here, because that question is, is it's, a, it's a question that is beyond answer. What do we actually do with it? What do we do with our history, with our forefathers? Our forefathers are not all burning in hell, because mm -hmm. that would be the logic by Christianity or by Islam. But... They're obviously somewhere. So what do we do with them? And that question has been kind of answered. We've reincorporated them. We've brought them back into the church through, you know, the Pentecostal, the dancing, the drumming. Even I mean, if you go to a mountain of fire church, it's like, it's like, which, sorry. 